Well, welcome everyone again, and thank you for uh, joining us in what I know will be a very interesting and very informative presentation uh, that we have arranged here at the Marco Island Historical Society in recognition of Black History Month. So I would like to um, welcome our speaker, uh, Magdalena Lamar, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about Professor Lamar um, and then about the topic that she's going to be sharing with us. So Magdalena Lamar was a full presser, professor excuse me, of history and sociology at Miami-Dade College. Since her retirement in 2016, she conducts lectures on Florida's history, culture, diversity, and social justice. She earned a BA in history and secondary education from Hunter College, an MA in history education from Stony Brook University, and completed postgraduate work in sociology and education at Florida International University. So we're very privileged to have Professor Lamar with us. Today, she's going to share information about the Southern Road to Freedom, Florida's Underground Railroad. The nation's first underground railroad was established in Florida in the late 17th century, serving as a beacon of freedom for runaway slaves from the American South. Existing before the better known Northern Underground Railroad, enslaved Africans gained their freedom by escaping and earning asylum in Spanish Florida. This presentation focuses on Florida's early history as a Spanish territory, the escape routes used by the runaway slaves and the black communities they established before the abolition of slavery in the United States. And so please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Lamar. Thank you, thank you very much, welcome. I do wanna say one, something very quickly. Uh, as mentioned, you can write into the chat room, but I would recommend maybe even having a paper and a pen because I know I can't type that fast in the chat room. So if there's a question or even like a topic or something that you want to know about, even if you just write like the topic, I'll, I'll remember it from the presentation. Um, because again, typing in those little chat things, I know I get <laughs> really flustered. Um, this way, if there's a question that you want to ask, you, you'll have a chance to at least start it somewhere so that we'll have a discussion at the end. I really hope that you do ask me questions. Um, as you can see here, there's a map. Don't worry about it not being clear. We're gonna see this map again because, and we'll see a number of maps. We'll see it again uh, because it will show us the roots. So this is what this presentation is about. It's about all of these different routes that were part of the period of self-emancipation, because this is what it is, self-emancipation of a group of people that were enslaved in American society. Um, this program, as you can see, is sponsored um, by the Florida Humanities Council. I'm part of their lecture series, and it's as a uh, partnered with the National Endowment, and they provide funding for it. So this is their announcement. It's part of Florida Talks. They have this program that you are being offered here by Marco Island and other programs that you might want to check. So please go to their website and check. Uh, this is where you might, you'll find probably others. You have other programs I saw on your list. I think they come from the humanities also, um, from Marco Ryland. I'm not sure because I did see a list of them. And welcome. And uh, we will start with our presentation. As you can see, this map is a little clearer, okay? Um, and it kind of highlights right in this area here, the whole, um, area that we're gonna look at. And you can see it's really very extensive. You can see how it goes in many directions. And we will be looking at all of these directions because they all, they the, the root, you have to think of this like a root, all right? With different areas that they cut off into. And this is the primary root, Florida. And from Florida, you'll see all of the extensions of where uh, refuge was sought. As was mentioned, this program is for Black History Month. And while this program doesn't address a topic of Black history, I want to emphasize this is Florida history, the history of Florida from the time of the Spanish um, colonization until be Florida becomes a territory of the United States in 1821. So this is Florida history, this is American history. And it's actually global history because we're talking about the country of Spain and their role in this whole colonization period. Uh, these, are, these individuals we're gonna look at in this program were pioneers, they were explorers. Uh, some of them were conquistadors. And this is what they did. They came here for many of the same reasons 
um, some free, but some not, but some were free, we'll see that. But they came here for the same reasons, looking for something new, looking to set up roots. And they played a major role in the early development of Florida when St. Augustine is established, right? If you studied American history, you probably know about the Underground Railroad going north. Uh, very few people uh, really know about this southern route. And I get, I think one of the reasons is because it's really embedded in the Florida history part of Florida, uh, the Spanish period of Florida history. And unless you really examine that period, um, you would not know about these areas. And Okay, I'm sorry, I was frozen there for a second completely. All right, I'd like to start with this quote, and I'd like to start with uh, basically this overview of the society that we're going to be looking at. Um, this, as you can see, this quote is from um, Abdullah Ibrahim. He's a South African jazz pianist and composer, and he has these wonderful quotes. And I wanted to raise this one because he makes a very important point. We talk about um, slaved and slaved people or slaves. We have to remember that they were not necessarily slaves. These were enslaved people. These were enslaved Africans. And that what he says is a very important point, that it wasn't slaves that were taken out of Africa. It was people. They were doctors, lawyers, teachers in their own societies because these people existed. You had these kinds of uh, relationships, people that would arbitrate for you in these societies in Africa, like they existed all over the world. So what you had were people taken out of Africa and enslaved. And one of the things that I also like to mention in the terms of this program is that the first people that came to the Americas were not enslaved. And I'm just going to point out to this one individual because he's one of the first people to set foot in the Americas and with his brothers, there was three of them, the Nino brothers, and they were a very important part of the early history. They sailed with Columbus. We know who they are, we know what their roles were, not only from Columbus's records, because he kept a journal, but from his crew manifest. His name was Pedro Alfonso Nino. He had two brothers. He was the pilot of the Santa Maria. I was Columbus's flagship. So he was among the first individuals to come to the Americas. He came with his three brothers. His brother, um, one of them, they were all uh, among the first persons of African descent to set foot in the Americas. His brothers all sailed. They were all free men. They would have been called Moriscos, or they would have been Moors, or they would have been, um, in, in Spain at this point, they would have been Afro-Europeans uh, because they were born and raised in Spain. They were Spanish culture. They were uh, Catholic. It was Christianity then, but Catholic. They spoke the Spanish language. Uh, their father had been captured. He was from the Almira area. He was a sailor. He was captured, but he himself was born in Spain. And um, his mother might have been uh, a, a, a Spanish woman, might have been white, uh, or she might have been from North Africa, from the Muslim community, because remember, Spain had been under Spanish, Spain had been under Muslim Islamic control for almost 800 years. So when Columbus sails in 1492, this is when Ferdinand and Isabella had finally reconquered Spain, the fall of Granada. And now the, the Moors that are there are going to be allowed to survive for a while, but they have to uh, convert to Christianity, but he would have been raised already as a Christian if he was living in Spain at this time. So he fits, you know, they called him a negro because if you were dark, this would be your, you know, the title you would carry. And you could see that he has somewhat what we would call North African or more, you know, the Moorish Morisco traits. Now, uh, a point about one of his other brothers, the second or third brother, the Nina, remember it was the Nina, the Pinta in Santa Maria, the Nina was owned by his brother. Right, so these were men of position, wealth, and status, born in Palos de Moguer in Spain, which was the uh, point of exit for Columbus when he sailed to the Americas. I like to introduce him first because I like to remind the audience that free men and women also came during this period. They were not all enslaved. And many of those who were enslaved uh, were able to acquire their freedom in different ways. Okay, we're gonna look at some maps now to understand when I address what Florida is, what I'm referring to. This first map is the Treaty of Tordesillas. Notice the year 1494. 
by now Columbus has reached the Americas. And even though most of the journals indicate that he did not recognize he had reached the new world, there were other explorers now coming to the Americas, uh, in particular Americo Vespucci, which is why we're called America, who recognized that this was a new continent, that he in fact had not reached Asia. Immediately what he did was, uh, the king, I'm sorry, what the king did, the, in this case, the, uh, the, Spanish, uh, the, the Spanish monarchs, they were called the Catholic monarchs. What they did was they requested the Pope to grant them all of the land that they had discovered in this new adventure. Uh, and one of the reasons was because the Portuguese had already gone around the Cape of Good Hope and reached India. And they claimed all of the land, right, that was east of, Sp of Spain and Portugal. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why Columbus, when he went to the Spanish crown and asked for this support, they kind of agreed to it because they already knew that this was the water route that everybody wanted to Asia. And maybe he was right. Or maybe he would discover something new because his, his letters uh, basically were letters to the great Khan, but also letters to claim any new lands for the crown. So we have here this line, arrogance of the times and the Catholic church and the power that the Pope drew. And then it was officially made and called the Treaty of Tordesillas. And what it did was it cut the world in half without really knowing how big the world was. Okay. Although there had been some uh, Greek philosophers that had estimated that the earth was round and the size of the earth, uh, and they knew that there was mostly water in these areas, they just didn't know about these continents. So they divided the world in half. And what did this say in the treaty? All of this belongs to Portugal, whatever they find here, and they didn't know yet. So this was like preparing belongs to Spain. Of course, we're gonna remember the British and the French did not agree or the Dutch. And this is why we have a lot of exploration that begins all the way north with Cabot, right? Uh, Marquette, La Salle, um, these people who sail for England, who sail for the French and they go all the way north. And what they're still looking for is this route, this direct route to Asia. Uh, when they realize that this is a continent here in this land, they now call it the Northwest Passage. This is what they were looking for when they come into Canada and claim this territory. This is actually what uh, Lewis and Clark were looking for when um, the President Jefferson sends them out to explore their continent, not just to map this region, but they're all looking for the Northwest Passage. They're looking for this another direct route because look how far this route is, right? And until the canal, the Suez Canal in these areas and here the Panama Canal are constructed, this is a very long distance for these ships. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because Florida did not know how big their territory was, but they claimed everything in the coastline. See, they when they when Ponce de Leon claims Florida, they claim the coastline. But look at the coastline; it would be up to Newfoundland. So they had no idea how big it was, but this was all considered Spanish territory. And I'm mentioning it again so you can see why the early Spanish settlements or Florida settlements were further north. So keep this map in mind, right? Let's go into this next period of um, who we are just talking about. The individuals that we're going to be talking about, we're gonna be learning about here were Maroons, right? And what basically this is, this is black resistance against slavery. These were enslaved people who fought for their own freedom, who escaped. And they created an alternative life. And Florida was the best place because of it, it is it was uninhabited, was not settled. And we know it has a lot of areas that are very vast and jungle-like, unexplored definitely in this time, unattractive in this time. Because once they discover the gold in Peru and Mexico, the whole idea is let's find gold, let's find gold. And originally they thought that Florida was part of Mexico. They thought Mexico was right next door. <laughs> so they're gonna get gold like everybody else. So you, this is why Florida will be the point of entry for many explorations, many of them totally doomed, right? But in the doom part where a lot of the uh, conquistadores and a lot of the explorers disappeared, what we're going to find is also an opportunity for these individuals that come to be known as Maroons. The term Maroon actually comes from the Spanish, cimarrones, and it refers to wild feral animals. It refers to uh, running away, escaping. 
The British shortened it, so they're the ones that use the term maroon. And there have there were many maroon communities throughout the United States, throughout Central South America, through the Caribbean. One of the most famous and well-known, if you know any of the history of the area of, of toward the Carolinas, the Dismal Swamp. Right. That was one of the largest in that region of these maroon or communities established by runaway slaves. Now, the term came to be used for anybody who escaped for freedom, anyone who ran away. Okay. Who were the first maroons? Well, basically, they start in 1502, which is when the island of Hispaniola is, is in the process of being settled. When Columbus does his first trip, uh, he, he, he does land uh, for some time in what today is Santo Domingo, Dominic, uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic. It was called at that time Hispaniola. And he leaves, one of his ships crashes there, so he has to leave a small settlement. Um, the natives welcome them to some degree. We don't know the entire story, but they quickly learn that this is not a good relationship because they start to enslave them. Right? The whole issue is enslavement. How did they justify this enslavement? Uh, one of the missions of the Catholic uh, monarchies was Christianization. So you were going to take these savages and you had to uh, bring them to the church, to Christianity, uh, baptize them. If they did not accept the word of God, unfortunately, they would be forced to do so. And of course, uh, you understand that when your society, your culture, your way of life is under attack, they'll fight back. And this is what happens. So we have um, this encounter that was not very positive and a native population that originally might have welcomed um, the Spanish, but will start to rebel. So in 1502, he starts to complain. Look at the complaint. They fled amongst the Indians and taught them bad customs and never could be captured. Who is they? The Afro, uh, Afro um, Iberians or the Ladinos, because they would have come from Spain, uh, enslaved and free because the first group that he brought were conquistadores. They were enslaved or free who would join the Spanish um, in exchange for possible earning of their freedom. It was, very, it was possible to earn your freedom within the slave system in Spanish. And all of these individuals would have been Catholic. They would have been baptized and they would have spoken Spanish and they would have been part of that society. But look what he's saying. They're arriving in Hispaniola and they're escaping. So he actually tells the king, don't send me anymore. You know, not only are they escaping, uh, but they're teaching, they're teaching the natives bad habits. This region of the Caribbean is very mountainous, all right? And this is why it made it possible. Uh, and again, not only was it the enslaved ones, but it was also the free. Some gold was discovered in Hispaniola, as it will be discovered in Puerto Rico and in Cuba. So they started to bring this group of, of, of enslaved Africans who were called bosales. Now, these bosales were not Castilian Blacks. They were straight from Africa, purchased from, this, from the Portuguese. But we have, again, I mentioned three um, African, persons of African ancestry, who also chose to leave to leave, even though they were free, to leave the, the life of being under the control or service of the Spanish crown. So here we have uh, what are basically the first Maroons in the Americas. Let's go to the first Maroons in Florida, all right? And keep in mind that once they set foot in Florida, they are going to establish some kind of a settlement. So from the moment that these individuals come to, the, to Florida, to the Americas, they become an integral part of its history and its development. And they play a pivotal role in the development and settlement of St. Augustine and actually the creation of the city. So the Florida Maroons are who we're going to meet next. Now, remember that map I showed you and I showed you how far up north, right? The uh, Florida coastline is? Well, one of the first, at Columbus was not successful. He does two attempts to uh, colonize, make a settlement in Florida. He's not successful. And one of the reasons is because the Native Americans are savage. They're, they're wild. They don't welcome them. Ponce de Leon takes with him an interpreter. He was a free, he was a free man who was, uh, um, again, um, um, and his, uh, he had been enslaved, was a free person of African ancestry. He was his interpreter who spoke Taino. And the reason he took him here is because the Tainos, once they realize the Arawak people who were called Taino here, once they realize that they will, e they will either have to flee, fight, or will be enslaved, they start to flee. 
And you know how they flee. They start going across, right? They start crossing. And they did the same trek that today many Cubans do when they cross the Straits and reach Florida. So they knew what was coming when this expedition, when Ponce de Leon starts to come, they knew that these individuals were not safe to be around. And they do fight. They do attack. So we have a number of expeditions which are going to be doomed because they will face a population, a native population, that will fight, right? The biggest killer will be disease but they will also die at the hands of the Spaniards, uh, either direct war or overwork, uh, starvation, being sold into slavery. Because only the Portuguese could sell African slaves and they were very expensive, then the Spanish uh, basically started to enslave here the native population because they needed laborers. The Spanish who came were soldiers, explorers, conquistadors. They want somebody to feed them, to work for them, to till the land. And they were seen as um, a source of income, a source of wealth. So, you know, the enslavement of a population that you conquer. This was from history. So here is the first uh, Maroons, right? And a very early expedition, 1526, one that's one of the many that attempted to uh, settle, establish a settlement in what was then La Florida, right? Because we saw it went all the way. It was low, originally he lands in this region of South Carolina, but the settlement was around this area, San, Madic, San Miguel de Guadalupe. And actually this may be where the first Thanksgiving was um, offered because they do talk about a feast of celebration. Now what happens, um, the Aiyong gets sick and he dies. The, the settlement was already in danger because they really were not prepared for the settlement. They expected to find gold and silver wealth, and it didn't, didn't happen. They, they may start off friendly with the neighbors, but they want the native population to work for them, or they want to enslave them. Not going to happen. They need to clear this land, and this land belongs to the native population. Now we have people encroaching and taking their land, taking their farmland, because they were uh, temporary settlers mostly. They would farm and move. So the, the colony was a disaster. Then there's a mutiny. Uh, there's an attack by the native population. And the Africans that are part of the pop of this um, co colony, at first they go against the mutineers, but then it seems they join the natives. So look, they had 600 to 700 colonists that left here the Dominican Republic, right? To, from, uh, and only, okay, 150 returned. This is what I mean by these, um, many of these expeditions being doomed. This was not a bad one. Uh, there's one expedition that only four out of 700 survived. Okay, four of them eventually took, I think, eight years to travel through Florida, through the Southern United States, back to Mexico. Four survived. The hundred enslaved Africans escaped. We don't know what happened to them, but these may be the first documented, because we don't know, right, but documented Maroons, the first people to settle, permanently settle in Florida because the Spanish left, right? And they, 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 um, they remained in this region. We don't have no, no clue. Uh, it is believed because this happened very often, they made an alliance with the native population and became part of their community. This is probably for me, the, the origin of the railroad because they will flee into the Florida. Remember, this is all Florida into the Florida wilderness. Um, we're going to now reach a period um, where we actually have Florida as an official sanctuary. But you can see that even before it's official, Florida has become a sanctuary for the enslaved Africans who flee. So what we see is, and from this, and this is an excellent source, I'll provide it at the end so you can, uh, you know, if you want to check out this book, but she's an excellent uh, researcher and she has a good account, not, of, not only Florida history in the Spanish period, but this society. But look at what she says. The next three centuries, Indian natives of the vast territory of La Florida provide a refuge. And this is going to be a common theme. This is how they will survive. But in some ways, these enslaved Africans will also help the enslaved uh, and the free natives because they are going to be also the target of enslavement. So this is what we call a period of sanctuary. And this is how long the sanctuary occurred. From the Spanish period, when we see those first Maroons escape, until 1821, when the United States officially uh, uh, acquires and, and Florida is incorporated into the United States. So the, um, I apologize for the quality of this map. I looked for a better one. Um, I just wanted to emphasize why St. Augustine 
uh, was so important in Florida, but especially St. Augustine, because there were many doomed expeditions, uh, but the Spanish were almost ready to give it up until something happens in uh, right near St. Augustine. And we have then Pedro Menendez de Aviles actually establish St. Augustine. But the reason is because Florida is in the direct path of the route to Spain for all of this gold. Again, it's very hard to see, and I totally apologize. I hope to find a better map someday. But you see the riches come from Mexico City. They cross through here in the Spanish galleons, and they cross right through Florida. You see this? Right going into to catch the winds to go back to Spain. These are the Spanish galleons that all the gold seekers are still looking for here in the Florida coast and in the Florida Keys, because these areas, you know, there were storms, the area was treacherous, and the pirates, the, this is where the pirates are all going to be, which is why St. Augustine is established, but we know that from the beginning, it will be a fortress. This is a military outpost, and it is to protect all of these galleons. And you see the next set of galleons that come from Peru? They're crossing from Peru all the way up, all the way again, right? So even though Florida did not attract settlers, Spain recognized we must co keep control of this area because this is what protects the gold that basically kept Spain enriched. So we have then St. Augustine, which is considered the oldest permanent settlement in the United States and continuous European and the first European because there is a Santa Fe is an older settlement in the United States, but it was originally settled by the native population and then it is settled by the Spanish. So this is really the oldest one 1565. And the reason that uh, Spain decides that this is this is going to be important to, to establish a stronghold is because the French on the St. On the St. John's River, right above North, uh, a little bit north, they establish a colony, a Huguenot, and uh, you know, and not only is this a claim to Spanish territory, but it endangers the ships that we just saw. So Pedro Menendez de Aviles uh, is sent by Spain, uh, to, by Spanish, by Philip II of Spain, to establish, to get, to remove the settlement, to get rid of this group but also to establish a permanent settlement in St. Augustine, which will, as I mentioned, be a fortified settlement because they need this protection. It will become fortified for another reason later, but you see the first stage. When he comes to uh, Florida, he does remove these individuals um, and he does establish, starts to build the community. Um, he also starts to explore the region. And one of the things that he finds are because of shipwrecks, he finds individuals that are living with the native population. And he actually ransoms five Spaniards, five Mestiza women, an unnamed black women, and another 18 Christians. And this has to do again with galleons coming through this region, being attacked, um, ships that just you know, uh, disappear because of storms. Now, what, what surprised him, this is who he found. What surprised him is that many of the um, free, because some of them were free. One of them was one. Of, one who he rescued was actually a, a, a free merchant, very wealthy, who was a, a mulatto. He was a Afro. He, he might have been Morisco, also, you know, descendants of the Moors. But he does rescue him, who his ship had gone down. He was a rich merchant. He rescues him. But the, there's a number of them that don't leave. They stay with the native population because they have families, they have children, and to some degree, if they had been runaway slaves. They would have been freer with the native population. Most of the Africans in the early period were men. They would marry into the Indian tribes because the tribe, the children would become part of the tribe and would automatically be under the protection of the tribe and would not be slaves. And, and, you, and the, there was a law protecting enslavement of the Indians, even though it was often violated. Again, this picture is not very good, but I do want to show you that this community in St. Augustine from the beginning include persons of African ancestry. Uh, this person is a servant, maybe a slave. You can see the job that they're doing. Uh, this person is working here. Again, we don't know their status, but this shows you that early settlement in St. Augustine. It was done in 1671, but based on the information of who lived in the settlement, this was a community that consisted of people from, you know, of different races that were part of the settlement and also different European countries. They had people from Italy, they had Greeks, they had Portuguese, they had French, uh, they had some English. They actually, uh, I think he finds uh, an indentured servant, a woman that had been, was among the natives. 
uh, population that he brings back to St. Augustine. So when we look at this region, okay, um, we're talking about a region that is uh, settled by a mixed community. Now, one of the um, facts, again, about this region, uh, by the way, the Fountain of Youth, most of the literature I found is that he, he wasn't looking for the Fountain of Youth. There was really no belief of this. They were looking for, for gold. They might've been stories, but that wasn't really the guidance. It was the gold, the gold that they would find in the Americas. Now, what do we know about St. Augustine? From that group, about 30 galley, 30 ships that, that um, Menendez de Aviles comes, you know, brings to the Americas, it included both enslaved and free Africans among the first settlers. Um, how important is this? The black population, free and enslaved, was 12% of the total in St. Augustine during this period. So they were very important and part of the community of the building. And again, these are mostly Ladino, Spanish or Iberian slaves. These would be skilled craftsmen. They would be servants. They would be farmers. They would be carpenters. And some of them will be soldiers because they did include militia. They included, there was always a shortage of Spanish. So they would have conquistadores and they would have soldiers that would be part of the militia. And when we look at this population, one of every five was free. So this was a park, a large community, again, of, of free and, uh, and enslaved Africans. Castillo de San Marcos. Remember I mentioned that this is going to be a fortified city. Um, and this is why they build this, this particular um, castle, this fortification was built. I think it was one of five or six that are built by the Spanish to protect its galleons. So you have Puerto Rico has one in Morro. You have a Cartagena de la Indias has one in, in, in um, um, northern um, Colombia. You have another one in the area of Panama Central where the, you know, because the ships would, they would bring the gold there by land from the west side to the east side before the canal is built. There was a road built very early. Um, they would have another one in Cuba, and they have another one in, um, in Santo Domingo. These forts were built, and they were manned. And the building of this fort, originally, they tried to do it with native labor um, and tried to use materials locally, but they just did not work. They, you know, the, the, the weather, the temperature. So then finally, they decide, we're going to build a castillo. We're going to build a fortified fort, and it has to right? This was built, yes, some of the native population participated, but this was built by Africans, most uh, enslaved Africans and free. Most of the builders were actually royal slaves that were brought from Cuba who had built the other fortifications. And they were, and they were called the royal slaves because they basically belonged to the crown, but these individuals lived independent. They had their families, they married, they were free, their, their, their children would be free. They could probably, probably were already themselves free or could buy their freedom eventually. They were skilled builders, stonemasons, artisans, um, as you can see, architects. So this fort was built by this group of individuals. I, I took a tour in St. Augustine re recently and you go by the water and, and the, the, the person talking about the tour said that this fort was built by Native population, Native Americans. And I just went, oh, my God. And my husband says, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. Because it's like look, not looking at the whole community that was there. And it was not the Native population. They did not have the skills and the materials either. They only knew they, they barely had settlements themselves. And they would have been very simple, as we'll see later. So San Castillo de San Marcos is a fort. Now, who was in this fort? There was always a shortage of Spanish who would stay because there was no gold. Um, and they didn't, you know, the, the land here is difficult. These individuals want it well. So from the very beginning, not only were the, the people who were settlers required to be part of the militia to defend the colonies, the settlements, but from the beginning, they would incorporate into them armed black militias. This was throughout the Spanish empire, including in, in Spain. And they knew that these individuals were fighters. They knew they were skilled military people because some of these individuals, their ancestors had fought with the Moors when they invaded Spain and were captured by the Spanish conquistadors when they removed the Moors from Spain. So there was always a history of armed people of African ancestry in Spain and they will also be a history of them in the Americas. And look at them. They are wearing the Spanish um, the uniform and they're carrying guns, unheard of in North America. Remember, even if you were free, you were not allowed, if you were black or mulatto, you were not allowed to carry weapons, to carry any kind of a weapon or use them. So they were fully clothed. They might've been 
enslaved, by the way. They might be free. They earned money and they had uniforms. And eventually they probably would be able to, with their own money they earned as part of the militia, right? And they were part of the Spanish militia. So they were integrated. Eventually what will happen is in St. Augustine in particular, they will actually create a, an entire black militia which was permanently in St. Augustine. Now, all of the residents, as I mentioned, had to form the militia, but by 1683, there was a company of free pardo, pardo means mulatto, mixed race, and moreno, which is a term they use for black, uh, maybe also mixed, we don't know, but who might have been, who might have been seen as not having any um, mixture, interracial, you know, they were not racially mixed. Moreno is a term they use black at this point. And it, it existed in, um, St. Augustine. So when we see what happens with the creation of Fort Mose, it's not a surprise. This is the history of this area. Now, the Florida Underground. Now we're going to get into the official Florida Underground because it's going to be legalized by an edict. Now, this is also from Jane Landers. We're going to see a group that's going to be accepted. And once they were accepted, this thing she calls the safe, the slave telegraph begins to occur. We have no clue how they would hear about it but they will flee south and they will take chances and some will make it. The group who attempted to leave in the Stono Rebellion, but were all captured, they were leaving from South Carolina, I believe, uh, they were headed, it's believed they were headed for Florida. They heard about it, they knew, uh, you know, di different ways she kind of explains, but the idea is that in this time of limited communication, that individuals would hear this and make the movement, make the, the, the attempt. What would, why were they doing it? Because they knew that there was a real true sanctuary in Florida. Here you see a better map again, okay? And now we're gonna be looking at one of the first groups who leave from this region right here around the area of the Carolinas, Charleston. In 1687, you could see a group of documented because we, we know there's others. This is different because this is documented. 11 escaped Africans were granted asylum. They got into St. Augustine and requested asylum. They were told, if you agree to serve in the militia, accept Christianity and be baptized, we will keep, we, you will be allowed to stay. And they did. Now, I don't know how long it took them to do this trick. They did come by water. Some of the people will come by land. They did come by water along the coast. Uh, when they arrived here, uh, the British uh, governor, colonial governor in, uh, in the Carolina says, uh, you need to send them back. They're runaway slaves, they're our property. Uh, one of them killed you know, uh, in the escape. And, the, and, the, and because of this animosity, this antagonism, this constant conflict between Spain now and the British, right? because by now the British have settled in the North and they've decided to take over the region of the Carolinas, which were Spanish territory, right? And they also will come later to Georgia, but they've taken over Spanish territory. Spain doesn't recognize this claim by the British. This is part of La Florida. So because they come from Spanish territory and there's this conflict between the British and the Spanish, they say, no, you have to prove that they are your slaves. You have to prove that this is where they escaped from. So he sends a message to the king. And what the king says is, we will accept uh, them and he passes a royal edict. So this is why I mean about it being legal. He actually says, this is the important part, as a prize for having adopted the Catholic doctrine and become Catholicized, set them all free. So this becomes the law. And this is what lets the future enslaved Africans who flee recognize we have a chance if we can get there. So of course, St. Augustine truly becomes a sanctuary, a legal sanctuary. One of the most significant individuals we'll meet in this period because of his role um, in, in different events in St. Augustine was Francisco de Menendez. He is one of those Maroons who escaped from the Carolina Low Country. In his case, the, the journey was by land, 400 miles, three years, through the swamps, through hiding out. But he arrived with 10 enslaved Africans from the Low Country. Two years after his arrival, he was the commander of the slave militia. So you see how easy it was to move within the Spanish society. He was unfortunately enslaved uh, for some reason, for specific reasons, which is another program. Uh, but he will get, he will earn his uh, freedom under the edict eventually. But what's important was even as an enslaved person, he was still the commander of the militia. He lived like a free man. All right, he had a salary. He was a soldier. 
It is his militia that will be part of the famous Fort Mose, right? Established in St. Augustine, right outside Castillo de San Marcos. This is a reproduction from the actual community because this area has been restored. And this city is very significant because of what it signified for the African uh, community, uh, the black community you know, in, the United, in this particular territory of Spain and in the United States in the future. It's established in 1738, all right? About a hundred Africans lived at the Fort Mose. You see where it's located? So this fort becomes a buffer. Guess what it, it's a buffer with? Georgia. So this is to prevent the British who have now also moved into Georgia from crossing into Florida and taking back their runaway slaves. So this is the buffer between Georgia and St. Augustine and also the buffer between, right? Uh, and within Florida, San Marcos and, and St. Augustine, the city of St. Augustine. So about a hundred uh, Africans lived in the fort, right? There were about 20 households. So this was a community. You see, it's an established community. Um, and this was the city's uh, black militia was the first line of defense from the North, because now you have not just the pirates in the ocean, you have the boundary with Georgia, Savannah, that region, you have that boundary and they need a protection. So when Oglethorpe founded Georgia in 1833, um, the sanctuary for escaped slaves became a real issue for Georgia because now we're getting closer and, this, and, and they're losing them. They're losing uh, enslaved Africans are, are escaping from the Carolinas further north, but specifically the Carolinas in Georgia. Now, and again, Georgia also considered this an illegal uh, colony. Now, what is important about it? It is a recognized free black community in, in then Florida. Uh, what, what they do is they actually get a charter from the, uh, and a, a town and it belongs to them. Uh, uh, and once this town is established, which is the first free settlement of, of Black people in the Americas, uh, legal settlement, it, it, again, this is a recognition of the beacon. And this is one of the markers. The town is called Fort Mose, but the actual town that they got, because it was not just the fort, it was the whole town, El Pueblo de Gracia Real, from the Royal Grace, I mean, the King, de Santa Teresa de Mose. But then it's just Fort Mose because the fort is the primary area. Now notice what happens. By 1738, another 100, <laughs> you know, uh, enslaved Africans have escaped from Georgia, right? And what do they do? They petition, you know, the town has a town and they petition to remain and they are allowed to stay. So this is why this particular region and Fort Mose and St. Augustine was the official uh, legal sanctuary, but it's not the only sanctuary. This becomes such an issue for the then British colony, uh, in particular Georgia and South Carolina, that Oglethorpe actually mounts uh, an attack on St. Augustine. Um, and he captures Fort Mose, but the militia is able to come back and take it. Guerrilla warfare, right? Spanish soldiers, they had a uh, militia, you know, they, they had some recruits that came and helped them from Cuba, the governor requested it. and. But basically the Fort, the, the hundred, you know, the, the Fort Mose militia, the Black Fort Mose militia is able to defeat Oglethorpe, who was a retired, uh, I think it was a general from the British military. And they are able to force him to leave. He has to leave. Um, and they are able to take, take back the territory. They are able to take back St. Augustine. They are able to claim uh, the fort and rebuild it. It was destroyed. Uh, so this basically really showed the British how dangerous and how committed these individuals were. So they become feared. This is, a, this is a problem for the North and we're gonna see this come under attack, but also shows to the Brit, to the Spanish, the value of this community. Now, what happens to Fort Mose? Well, unfortunately in 1763, uh, the French and Indian War in America, the seven years war in Europe, uh, Spanish was on the wrong side, the British won. And what they do is in the Treaty of Paris, the Spanish give up Florida, okay, that's a British period before it actually is sold to the United States. 1763, I think about 10 years to 1773. Uh, so they give it up because the British had captured Cuba and Cuba was more valuable to the Spanish. Remember the forts there and the path into the galleons? Cuba was more valuable to the Spanish than Florida really. So they give up Florida. But this is a problem for the, the militia, the black militia. So what happens is, during the 10 month period, 
St. Augustine, the Spanish settlers leave and they go to Cuba. But Cuba will be one of the next routes of the Florida Underground Railroad because the Spanish militia, some of the community, the black community stays, uh, any of them who were free and owned land, they would stay because the British kind of still, rec you know, in this territory will recognize them. But, but most of the runaway slaves know this is not the place to stay because they will be claimed by the, uh, the slave owners who lost them. So fearing this enslavement, right, because of the escaped slaves, especially Menendez, he was a runaway slave, they join the Spanish and flee to Cuba. So Cuba becomes, and that's why that arrow, one of the arrows is Cuba. They settle there, they remain there. They do not return back to, Fort, uh, to St. Augustine when this becomes a Spanish territory. Today, you can go to the Fort Mose Historic State Park and they recreate. There's a recreation of this period in their history. You can see it. Okay, let's go here quickly. Um, I'm going to so here. What are we gonna look at now is the Florida is a haven, right? For everybody, okay? But again, now we're looking at a new group. These people were called the Black Indians, the Maroons, all right, um, who joined the Seminoles will come to be known as the Black Indians. Not all of the Maroons went to St. To Augustine. They did not all want to serve the militia. Many of them decide to do their own free settlements. And what we see here is a map of all of the settlements that existed that were not only Seminole settlements, these were Black villages and forts. These were areas that they chose to go into if they did not want to serve the militia, okay? These people, because they join the native population, will come to be known as the Black Indians. Because they live with the Seminole Nation, they'll be called Black Seminoles or Seminole Maroons. Some of them will intermarry with the uh, Seminole Nation, especially the escaped slaves, because again, their children um, will be considered free because their children will belong to the mother and the children of Native Americans and the Native Americans were not, would not be sold into slavery. But if the mother was free, the child would be free. We know that in Virginia, slavery became attached to the birth of the mother, right? The status of the mother. But you look at all these settlements, right? Here's Fort Mose. We're going to look at this one next. But we have settlement, and these are the ones that we know about. So we have a lot of settlements throughout this period in history. Now, the Black Seminoles are specifically Maroons who joined the, the Florida, uh, the, the Seminole Nation in Florida. And they're going to be alive with them from about, um, um, from 17 to 1850s. And basically they're facing a common enemy. In this case, the Seminoles have fled from the North, from Georgia and the Carolinas, because their land is being encroached on. And they come into Florida and they are they are related to the Creek, but they were a separate group. So they will come here and they will go into these isolated areas that we saw and they will make all of these settlements. Look at this. Right. Um, and then we know that these settlements and you'll see the names. Look at this. All right. It tells you that this is a Seminole Indian village with black residents because some of them live together. Right. But then you had others like this one that in the big swamp Ocala. Right. This was a free black village. So they lived independent. You had them together and independent. Those that lived with the Seminoles themselves might've been enslaved or, or, or more like serfs. They would they lived in the community. They might've been to married. They, they called them slavery, but the, the Seminoles did not sell them. Um, they would be basically more like the serf system where they would share because they were farmers. These individuals, a lot of them came from the Carolinas too. Uh, they knew how to grow rice. Uh, and they knew farming techniques where the Native Americans would stay basically not sedentary and more uh, hunters and gatherers still or, or very light farming. Uh, here's another community. And you see the names? These are Black names, Powell's Town, right? So this is another Black village, right? With, uh, uh, and then this one was led by Osceola, right? Seminole, Seminole Wars, he's, uh, he dies, the leader of the Seminole Wars. Black Fort's another one. Look, look at this one up here, Mulatos Girl Town. So you can see from the names, these were black communities, even if they were within the, the, the Seminole territory, okay? Now we're gonna get to the Negro Fort. By now we're in the War of 1812. And what's happened in the War of 1812 is that um, the English are fighting the Americans. They try to establish a settlement, uh, a fort actually, right in this region here. And it's an attempt during the War of 1812 to regain you know, their territory. Of course, they have to go back. Uh, the fort is abandoned, but this fort was, was set up by the English. And when they leave, they leave it fully armed in the hands of the Maroons that have joined them. 
including a group of individuals known as a Corps of Colonial Marines. Many of these individuals were enslaved Africans who had joined the British in the American Revolution by Lord Dunmore, who had promised them, if you join us, we will free you. When the British lose the American Revolution, they take these individuals back with them. They settle them in the Bahamas and in Bermuda. Uh, and when they go to this attempt to, uh, to, to free, you know, during the War of 1812, set up this area between the Louisiana territory, basically this is a buffer zone with um, Andrew Jackson, because this is where he's located, the Battle of New Orleans. These individuals come to the fort. Now, this fort uh, basically, we, uh, the population in the fort increased. By the time that they're ready to leave, the fort has 400 fugitive slaves and another 800 that have looked, moved around this region. This is a very big settlement. Usually they settle in small units because you have to flee. So this was a pretty big settlement. So the British leave and they disband the Corps and they take whoever wants to go, but some of them stay, but they leave the fort in the hands of these Maroons. News of the fort attracts more settlers in the region area, but news of the fort also alarms the Georgia people and Andrew Jackson and the United States in particular. So what they do is they set up a situation to fight, to attack the fort. Unfortunately, what actually happened is they were fortified. The um, Jackson's, uh, you know, you see here the, the fleet, the, I'm sorry, the ships that were basically Navy ships with cannons. One cannonball was hot and hit the magazine and the magazine exploded. So you know in that contained space what happened to the whole uh, fort. Uh, it was terrible. Basically, those that did not survive um, ended up uh, being sold, but very few survived. But everybody in the fort uh, um, suffered the consequences of this big explosion. Uh, they tried to um, he tried to heal them, but you know this is the conditions of the time, and very few do survive. They're actually buried. A, uh, this is the Gatson. It's called Fort Gatson today. This is the remnants of it. And there's actually a, a cemetery here. It's in the area of uh, Apalachicola, the National Forest. Very hard to get to, but it is a, another one. Now, what begins to happen is now what we call is the Seminole Wars. And that attack is the first of the Seminole Wars. The Seminole Wars are three wars between the Seminole Nation and the Black Seminoles and Andrew Jackson. Keeping track of the time here. Okay, so what we have here is basically the American general saying, this is called the Seminole War, but this is a Negro War because they are the ones fighting. These are the individuals that are defending their freedom. The first Seminole War, right, uh, was a big concern for the American slave owners. Why? The British, I'm sorry, at this point, the Americans did not win the war. They didn't lose it, but they didn't win it because uh, they never surrendered. The Seminoles never surrendered. They basically came to an agreement. And as a result of this agreement, they agreed to go into the central area here, right, where they were given this territory, which is the first reservation. Conditions were terrible. This was not the best land. Uh, they didn't want the Black Seminoles with them, but they were the farmers. They break a lot of the conditions of the treaty. So what we have is the Seminoles rebel. And the Autumn Owners Treaty, which officially sells uh, the United States to um, Florida to the United States, this marks a problem because now the, 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 the Africans, enslaved Africans, the Black Seminoles know that now they're under US territory and any of them who are escaped, they will be sold or brought back into slavery. The United States purchased Florida, right, for $5 million. Um, and one of the agreements that had to be reached was um, that the Seminoles would be allowed to keep their, their Black Seminoles, right? That they would not be taken from them. Uh, there is a town, this settlement here, Angola in Florida, 1812, 1821. This is where a lot of the, the few survivors of the Negro Fort will go here. This was another very large city. Um, and Andrew Jackson was determined to destroy it. And he has, this is, he actually goes after it uh, from before the official selling. So what we have, uh, Florida. So we have here basically the largest maroon community. Today, it is an official um, area. It's near Brandonton, I believe, and it actually has been excavated because the community found what they believe was a settlement. Uh, they didn't know if it was native or not. So they called in some university professors and they discovered that this is the Angola settlement. Uh, they have a marker which tells you that it was a refuge of peace in this region and that it was inhabited also by a large population. 
So what we have here though is when Andrew Jackson attacks the, the settlement, right? In 1821, um, they need to escape because he, he kept, basically he killed who he could, he captured who he could, uh, he enslaved them. It was a full military charge into this community and they escape. And how do they escape, right? It's called the Saltwater Underground Railroad. Why is it called that? Because they leave Biscayne and they go to the Bahamas. This community is still living in Andros Island, Bahamas. They were discovered by someone. Uh, they know their history. The Bahamian people call them the Black Indians. They know who they're, who they're linked to. And in 2018, there was a festival when you had the official opening of the Angola settlement, you know, the, the historical site. The descendants came to back to Angola and told the story because they know their story. These people of Andros Island are these Seminole Indians. The Indian Removal Act will require the natives to be moved out of the Georgia territory. And this included moving any of the black Seminoles and the Indians that were left from Florida. Uh, again, the, the idea is that, you know, they want their land and that these, they don't, these are, these are, and these are African people. Some of them run away who are now free. They want them in the Oklahoma territory. The wars are basically fought resisting this. They do manage to move them in different periods. And you have a lot of Seminoles that will go to the Trail of Tears and will die in the Trail of Tears. Very often when the Seminoles would go, you had a lot of the Black Seminoles join them. So during these three wars, right, we have them participating in these different attempts to remove them to the uh, Oklahoma Territory, which was the Indian Territory. Okay? Uh, this is a marker for the Seminole Trail of Tears, and this would have been their path. They took them partially by ship and then they took them by land. Um, this is a lot considered the largest rebellion, right, in, in the United States history. We're running a little bit, I'm almost done, a little bit out of time, but I'm willing to stay. I'm, you know, it's no problem, okay? Uh, but we're almost done. Uh, this is the largest rebellion. Little uh, John Horse, uh, he's a black Seminole. He was, uh, uh, his, his father was believed, his mother was uh, Native American, his father uh, African, and slave African, free African, we don't know. But he does, he convinces, he goes with the last group of Seminoles to the Oklahoma Territory in, seven, in 1838. He agrees to go with them. But he doesn't trust this treaty. He doesn't trust that they're going to be safe in the... Um, in the territory, even though he agrees at the end of the, of the Third Seminole War. And in order to get them to go, the Governor Jessup, the military lead, uh, general Jessup, agrees that their freedom, free and enslaved Africans, but the enslaved Africans, that they will be allowed to remain free. Of course, when they get to the Oklahoma Territory, the Northern slaveholders, they're furious. And they don't, they say, he didn't have a right to do this. These are our property. And they start picking them up actually attacking and um, trying to retrieve them. So what they decide to do, what he decides to do is they're going to leave. And this is the last route of the Underground Railroad. An estimated 100 Seminoles, all right, um, moved, uh, moved deep into the, Amazon, into the Everglades, but those that do go, right, those that do go into, um, those that do go with the territory, to the Oklahoma Territory with the Seminoles, they also decide we're not staying here and they leave for Mexico. So Mexico will be the last route of the Underground Railroad. Facing the threat of enslavement, about 180 Black Seminoles escape to Mexico. The Mexican government gives them asylum and gives them a settlement, nacimiento, right on the border. They, do, they stay there for 20 years and they're called Mascogos. They still live there, by the way. Guess what their job was? The Mexican government said, you can be here and you will be free. We will not return you, but you will be our border patrol. Their job was to pretend, prevent the Texans from crossing the border and taking enslaved people. Okay, we're almost done. This was John Horse's trip. So this becomes the last link or the last route of the Underground Railroad, all right? Their descendants today, they live in Oklahoma, Texas, Bahamas, and New Mex Northern Mexico still. Uh, after the American, after the Civil War uh, and slavery is ended in the United States, some of them cross the border and live in Texas still. They call freedmen in Oklahoma, Seminole Scouts, the Buffalo Scouts and the Buffalo Soldiers, Black Indians in Bahamas and Mascogos in Mexico. 
Today's presentation, as you can see, was this relentless search for freedom and fight for freedom for a people that freed themselves. Okay. Thank you for joining me and I am available for questions. <laughs> so please feel free to ask any questions you have. Yes, yeah, so, so we'll, uh, we'll continue. Excuse me, uh, with a, a brief Q&A session, I'll be monitoring the Q&A box. So if you would like to um, enter your questions, please do so. I have one that I'd like to start us off with. Yes, I'm you. losing my voice. Um, and, <laughs> and that is, what relationship existed between the freedom seekers and the Seminoles truly? What was that relationship like? Okay, um, they were allies, total <clears throat> allies. And uh, the Seminole Nation depended on them to um, depended on them for their to be fighters because they were fighters. They were you know they they had they were guerrilla fighters. And and one of the things that uh, Jessup says is that the reason for this war you need to call this war a Negro war because they were really the ones that were steadfast. The Seminole Nation was able to negotiate with the you know with the British with the Spanish, but the, the remember that the Seminole the Black Indians can't. So they're going to form they're going to form different relationships. Unfortunately, uh, some of them were like enslaved. The relationship is almost like slavery, uh, but it's not a shadow. They're not sold. The Seminoles never bought and sold them. When they go to Oklahoma, this is a problem because they will then try to sell them. And this would not be the Seminoles, but the Cree who practice shadow slavery. So their relationship uh, very often they married into the tribe. They did, and if they married into the tribe, they are part recognized. Excuse me, Bailey, please. They married into the Black uh, nation. They were Seminoles. They're considered, they're part of the Seminole nation and they get money uh, uh, eventually in some of the treaties. Uh, some They live independent though. Today, the tribe, some of them still live with the tribe, the freedmen in Oklahoma, but some of them live here in Florida and other regions in Texas, but they're independent, all right? Um, so it's going to be a mixed relationship. Allies, um, sometimes uh, enslaved, sometimes part of the nation. Um, and they are Black Indians. A lot of them did intermarry and there are communities of, of what are actually mixed race, Indian and Native American. Um, so this one would be a relationship of need, dependency, uh, inter-reliance, you know, they, they relied on each other. Um, but the fact that they chose, that the, the Black Seminoles chose to join them in the Everglades and chose to follow them to Oklahoma indicates that this was a, cho a mutual choice, that this was a relationship of, of, you know, that they were together, that there was some kind of interconnection with them and that they were seen. Okay, did that answer your question? I can't hear you. I'm okay, sorry. no, yeah. it's okay. I do, I do have another question. Uh, that was entered into our chat. Just prior to Civil War, did Black slaves still try to escape Florida? Florida was part of the Confederacy, but there was a fort, Fort Union, or Union Fort, at Key West. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, during the Civil War, yes. Uh, once again, the, uh, when especially, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation basically did the, uh, you know, and offered the freedom to any of them who would, you know, within the within the Confederacy, only the Confederacy. But part of it was also to get them to join the Union soldiers. And what happened in Florida was there were many who, who fought, they were part of the South, who did fought under the Confederacy because they were forced. But many of them did leave, did run away again, um, and went and joined the Union and fought under the Union uh, flag here in Florida. Um, because again, they were here uh, because this was their home, but they, the reality was that under the Confederacy, they were never going to be free. You know, that was, you know, that was it. And the chance they were taking was um, to join the Union and win. But also keep in mind, you're going to have some that fought for the Confederacy because in the end, the Confederacy did not have enough soldiers. And this was one of the problems that started to occur between Jefferson Davis and the government he established. He actually offered freedom to any of the uh, enslaved Africans that joined and fought for the Confederacy. 
he didn't have too many volunteers <laughs> because uh, again, you know, now you're offering, you know, but you did have many that did join the Confederacy also uh, under this, you know, promise of freedom. Uh, but you had many, like mentioned, join the, the union and fight to fight. These, there, many of those who fought for the union, these are part of the Buffalo soldiers that go to the frontier, to Texas. And these are the ones that use the Mascagos, the Black Seminoles, Seminole scouts as their scouts in the Indian Wars in the West. This, that's that group, the Buffalo soldiers. Uh, Buffalo soldiers. I, I, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I do have another question for you. Uh, blacks were often barred from schools and learning to read. Did the early Blacks, like Fort Mose and sailors, did they learn Spanish or did they learn to speak Seminole? No, they, okay, that's a, that's a great question. They, they spoke Spanish. One of the things that was uh, interesting, very often they would be used as interpreters because they also spoke many of the native languages, right? So they would be used as interpreters. So they spoke Spanish definitely because they were part of the Spanish community. They spoke, um, in the case of the native population, they all spoke and they, during the Seminole Wars, in addition to being soldiers, they were um, translators for the, both the North, you know, the soldiers and for the Seminole nation. John Horse was a translator. Uh, they also spoke Seminole, right? But the language that they spoke also was very special. They speak a, a form of language that's related to Gullah. And they actually are related to the Gullah people of the low country in Carolina. And their particular language is a Gullah Seminole mix. It's very unique. They still speak it or they still have words. So you're gonna find that they actually were multilingual depending on the community they were dealing. And they spoke English. They understood English too because they, they became the translator between all of these groups uh, because many of them had been escaped right from Georgia and, and the Carolinas. And even further north, they say that uh, you know anybody in the south would go south as opposed to those that would go north. So uh, Florida continued because it was very, remember that Florida is very undeveloped. I mean, there's still areas today, think about it, that have you know regions that are not developed, these large forests. So even during that period, you still have slaves during, before the Civil War and during that whole period of the Civil War, escaping and trying to hide out in Florida. Uh, it has always been a refuge because of its wildness and its uh, undeveloped areas and the swamp and the Everglades. Uh, when they built the road through the Everglades, the Army Corps of Engineers, I think it was in the 30s, that's when they found the Seminole tribe in the Everglades in Big Cypress in that region because they were living there and nobody knew until they built that road, the Tamiami Trail. I don't know when they built it. I think it was in the 30s. They built, they built it from, side, from, from east to west. Another question? <laughs> Um, that's all the questions that we have, actually. Uh, I know you have one more slide that you want to share. Thank you. Um, with uh, from Florida Humanities. And I did want to mention that when we end the webinar, a survey will pop up for our, our attendees. And I'm hoping you take a few moments to uh, answer the questions. You know, the Florida Humanities is so important important to our ability to bring these types of programs to you. And we're so grateful for everything that they do to preserve and share uh, Florida history. So um, if you can, please do take the survey. And thank you so much, Magdalena. It really was a, a, a wonderful presentation. And um, I'm sure everyone walks away much richer for mm -hmm. what you were able to share with us. I'm sorry that I rushed at the end, but I was looking at the time. I said, let me get this information in because I want them to see all the roots. I have one more slide in case you want to communicate with me. Okay, thank you for participating. I hope you found it both entertaining and informative. If you want information like readings, links about, uh, you know, just in general, this Spanish period, um, you can contact me at my, yeah, my first and last name at Gmail, or you can just scan this. This is my Facebook page. This is a book I recommend if you want any information. This is an excellent book. I have tons more. And you, I have a first and last name on Facebook. You can also find other programs that I Zoom because I have other series. Uh, but if you want to contact me, if you have a question you didn't think about, but you want to send it to me, please. I love to hear from everyone a suggestion, a recommendation. If I spoke too fast, I'm sorry. I, I see the time and I start, okay, I have to, I have to finish this. <laughs> I have to try and get it through. But thank you for inviting me. Um, I really am so grateful. Uh, I'm retired, but this is my fun life. Um, and I'm still teaching and I'm still sharing. And I, the research, I'm a, I love research. I love oh, research. 
And this well, is we have a number of our participants saying thank you to you. And so on behalf of the Marco Island Historical Society, um, we greatly appreciate all that you have to share. Thanks, thank Magdalena. Thank you.